Everspace 2. Really? Why? Well, first, I feel like we have been starved for story-based, space-themed RPGs for a long time. And the ones that we have gotten lately are nothing to write home about, really. And second, Everspace 2 was marketed as a story-driven ARPG of all things, in which you control a spaceship, no less, rather than a character. Well, all right. So I ask you, what's not to like about this concept? But the better question is, is it worth the whopping $50 that it currently goes for on Steam? I don't believe that. But maybe it is worth the $28.81 that it currently goes for on good old games. And because I know how much of an issue it is to pay $50 for an indie game, I have a little something that might help you if you live in the United States. And it's a brief word from Mint Mobile, who I am partnering with for today's video. What does Mint Mobile have to do with video games? Well, if you sign up right now, and that is before October 31st for Mint Mobile's premium wireless plan, you'll be getting it for $15 a month. And that is 50% of the plan's regular price. And that means high-speed data, unlimited talk and text, and nationwide coverage. There are also no obscure fees that we conveniently forgot to mention, nor, well, you have to sign up for a full year, which I know are two of the biggest issues some of you guys have with your current service providers. And on top of that, within four months, you will have saved more than this game cost, or some of the other titles that I am going to tell you about soon. So visit mintmobile.com slash yield and sign up for Mint Mobile's unlimited wireless plan for $15 right now. And when I say right now, I'm not even close to kidding you. That's mintmobile.com slash yield, link in the description section down below. By the way, always support indie developers and companies that cut out the middleman. I think this game scratches some very specific itches that no other game in the genre is scratching right now. And who knows, maybe you suffer from some of these itches? Well, let's find out, shall we? Welcome to Ye Old Entertainment, my name is Alex, and as you know, it is my duty, my mission, my purpose in life to help you decide whether that game that you have been thumbing for so long is indeed the right game for you or not. And as you also know, I review games using a system of categories that I feel are relevant to the genre of the game at hand. And today we're going to be taking on Everspace 2, an action RPG with real-time combat. And when it comes to those, character creation and character progression are up first. In Everspace 2 you play Adam Rosling, a smart mouth, smart ass, too cool for school dude who keeps jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. But none of that matters as far as character creation and character progression goes, because over the course of the game you'll be leveling up and costumizing your ship, not your character. There is nothing akin to classes in this game. You start with the one and only ship that you have, and you costumize it with upgrades and gear. You can buy more powerful spaceships over the course of the game though, but we'll get to that later. In Everspace 2, you gain experience points by traversing the galaxy, killing things, sorting out puzzles, and retrieving MacGuffins for different people. And every once in a long while, you'll get enough experience to level up. And when you do, you get the customary good old-fashioned injection of dopamine that lets you know that you are now a bit less of a sitting duck than you were before. And like a good old authoritarian state, the game decides what's best for you and increases your ship's stats accordingly. But every five century, I mean, levels, you get a teeny tiny bit of a say on how to make your ship better, also known as a character perk. That's right, after roughly, what, 12 hours or so of space, pew pew pew, you get to the side if you want to. Receive 25% less damage while boosting. Consider that boosting lasts a very short time and has a cooldown time. A shield that pops up for 10 seconds the first time you would take lethal damage and that you can only use again after you've docked at a station. Or an instant shield recharge every time you kill an enemy. And if you are thinking, man, those actually sound like pretty potent perks, that's because you haven't played the game. 
They are like choosing between getting the mightiest of erections, but only at 2 a.m. when your wife's asleep, being able to read the minds of cats, but you have a dog as a pet, and temporarily becoming immune to your broccoli allergy when you hate broccoli and don't ever eat it. This character perk business really starts to shine though at some point in the game, and that point is when you reach level 20 or so. Now that's when you start to get the good stuff, my man. Character perks aren't the only way to improve your ship, fortunately. You also have companions in Everspace 2 who are more like allies who tag along because they have little choice. These allies offer unlockable tiered perks, which are upgrades that you can acquire at any given time if you provide the required materials. And this is pretty interesting because most of the components needed for the best upgrades aren't just lying around for you to grab. Chances are you won't find them by simply following the yellow brick road of the main quest. You really need to go out of your way to explore the remote confines of the galaxy to get some of these, or find a way to craft them. And that's how you're going to get your money's worth out of Everspace 2, because exploration is where this game truly shines. So if nothing else, getting the materials that your companions require to upgrade your ship is a nice excuse for you to engage in the most interesting thing the game has to offer. But like your character's perks, most of your companion perks are nothing to write home about either. They are more quality of life features, like being able to automatically send your loot to your stronghold without having to go back yourself. I mean, I won't say no to this feature, of course, but I was kind of hoping some of these perks would improve my pew 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 capabilities. Many of the upgrades your companions have to offer require the same components, so there is some manner of opportunity cost attached to these improvements, and that makes them valuable. But since these upgrades contribute only marginally to your combat capabilities, they are still nothing to get too excited about. And this is unfortunate because it could have been great. For example, Elec is the only companion who joins you in battle with his own ship, not counting the game's story-related scripted events, that is. And his perks serve mostly to upgrade his own ship. And he's a pretty decent combat aid, but he drops by whenever he feels like it. And that means that sometimes he's not going to show up when you need him the most, and sometimes he's going to drop by when you have everything under control. And see, if these companion upgrades had been conceived more like a system of talents for players to build their ship, the last tier down Elex's upgrade path would have been something like a communication gadget to summon him whenever you wished, maybe with a cool down time or something to balance things out. If that had been the final skill on Elex's upgrade path, we'd be talking about the Elex build, for example. But as it is, the companion perk system feels like a bit of a wasted opportunity. But luckily, there is another form of progression in Everspace 2, and it's the power of creds. That's right, if you manage to become some sort of space Elon Musk, you'll have access to the Coebas of spaceships. This is how you go from amateur space jockey to an unstoppable juggernaut of galactic badassery. And if you're one of those douchebags who was into collecting cars, you're probably not watching this video, but hey. If you are a car collector douchebag at heart, there is a lot to say to your frivolous thirst in Everspace 2. You can have various different spaceships, and you can costumize their appearance in lots of useless ways if that is your thing. And I hope it is your thing, because other than showing off your different spaceships to yourself, your wife, and your cat, there is no point in having different spaceships, really. Just the most powerful one money can buy. And I think this is yet another wasted opportunity. See, you could have had a spaceship for racing, another one for getaways, and another one for, say, infiltration missions. Just like your cars have different uses in games like The Saboteur. But nope, combat in Everspace 2 is the only thing that demands anything from your spaceship. Everything else you do in this game, you can do equally efficiently with any spaceship. In ARPGs, you are supposed to prioritize your character's build. and. These games are often designed in a way that makes you hyper-focus on loot hoarding, getting the best talents for your class, and the build that you're going for, and making sure your resistances are all maxed out before the final stretch of the game. But in Everspace 2, the class and talent aspects of the formula go out the window, and you're only left with what, in my opinion, is the most boring aspect of the formula, which is the loot hoarding part of the equation. And that doesn't amount to an awfully interesting progression system, if you ask me. The perks you unlock around level 20 and beyond make things a little bit more interesting. Purchasing the best ship money can buy is tight. And some companion upgrades are fairly useful. But none of that makes your spaceship's progression all that interesting. Certainly not compared with the best titles in the ballpark. 
gameplay. Every Space 2 has an interesting gameplay mix. Combat is the most important aspect of the game as you would expect from an ARPG, but if you ask me, the game would have been much better if that hadn't been the case because the game is at its best when exploration takes the wheel and combat and puzzle solving dance around it. The gameplay mix in Everspace 2 is almost CRPGistic in its design, and the game is truly at its very, very best on those rare occasions when it manages to blend together all these aspects into a solid, cohesive experience and when it gives the player a story-driven incentive to commit to this experience. Unfortunately, these moments are rare peaks in Everspace 2, and the game seems to devote as many efforts to annoy players as it does to entertain them. I can confidently say that in my 40-ish years of gaming, I had never had such an extreme love-hate relationship with a game. Not ever. Not even close. This game is a checklist of shit that I utterly detest in video games on one hand, and on the other, a Santa Claus list of things that I had always wanted to see in a video game but never did. And some of these things are implemented beautifully. Combat can be crazy fun or utterly infuriating. It rarely sits somewhere in between. In my opinion, it suffers greatly from one of the worst aspects of the ARPG genre, and it's that it is heavily conditioned by level and gear checks. If you have played games like Star Wars Squadrons, you already have a pretty good idea of what the combat is like in Everspace 2. I am not particularly good at this type of combat, in fact, I suck like nobody's business at it, and that's probably why I found it not grindingly difficult. But I lost count of the times I got insta-killed by a group of enemies that were three levels higher than me, only to crush them like lowly worms a couple of levels later, the only difference being the gear and the level. That's not to say that this game requires no degree of tactical planning and skill, it does. And you'll see that bringing some of those Star Wars Squadron skills front and center, or dusting off some of your old tactics from games like Wolfenstein 3D, I kid you not, and most especially Afterburner can be tremendously helpful. And I imagine that beating some of these encounters while being underleveled is where the get good crowd get their money's worth. I don't think there are any enemy attacks and moves for which there is no counterplay, that must be said. And this is a positive thing, of course. So I guess if you are an ace space dogfighter, there is always a way for you to come out on top in all of these encounters, even if you are underleveled. But some enemies have just too many immunities and protections that are restored over time, and if you hit like a pussy, or not with the appropriate type of damage, you are just not going to have the numbers to beat some of these motherfuckers. There are many ways to play Everspace 2, and if you are a seasoned ARPG veteran who knows his or her endgame in this type of games, you are probably going to be on top of every combat situation for the most part of the game. But if you are new to the genre, or an utter dumbass like me, and if you suck too badly at space combat on top of that, you are going to be in for a world of pain. But Alex, you are a fine connoisseur of the fine arts of gaming, and have braved challenges that go from Throne of Ball to Sekiro to old classics for real men like the Contras, the Ninja Gaidens, and even the Battletoads. You couldn't have sucked that much in this game, could you? <laughs> Shit! One minute, 37 seconds later. One minute, 37 seconds later. God damn. Well, allow me, dear viewer, to regale you with the tale of my own stupidity. One that, I would hope, would serve as an example of what not to do, so that when and if you decide to pick up this $50 indie title for $28.81 on good old games if you hurry, you milk all the fun it has to offer to the last cent. Like the complete amateur sucker that I am, I mostly stuck to the main quest line and took only those side quests that didn't look like another pain in the ass. In my defense, the story is actually pretty engaging. It's not Dostoevsky levels of writing, and it has one of the most worn out cliches as one of its main pillars, but it has a solid premise and the stakes are always high. But see, if you stick to the main quest line, and even if you take most of the side quests you'd run into while flying about to the game's beaten trail, you are still going to eventually get to a point in which you are going to be on your level. And this can become a monumental exercise of frustration because of how quests are designed in Everspace 2. Most missions in Everspace 2 are multi-step. 
and this is how they work. Let's say you pick up a mission with Quest Giver X and this mission requires you to go to Space Station A to talk to someone, then to Planet B to do a series of things and finally to Asteroid C to do yet some other thing. Well, you can horse around the galaxy and do whatever the hell you want between Space Station A and Planet B. But once you get to Planet B, if your business there has multiple steps and these involve combat, said combat will be presented in the form of waves of enemies that you need to survive. And if you are underleveled, you can tilt the odds in your favor by using some of your precious battle consumables like rockets and AoE grenades and your ship's special devices. But there is no way for you to know beforehand how many waves of enemies you're going to get, the type of enemies that you're going to face, or how many enemies each wave is going to have. So it is impossible to plan the battle ahead of time, and that means that you're gonna die again and again and again. And it may also happen that you find out that you are ridiculously outgunned, and that you straight out can defeat these guys without figuring out some sort of game-breaking cheese. Well, tough shit if this ever happens to you, because the game does not allow you to leave Planet B until you have completed every step of the mission, and it also doesn't allow you to save in between waves of enemies, which means that you can't tuck tail and come back later. We fight, or we die. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, but chances are you are going to fight and die, repeatedly after only a few seconds of battle, until you find the tactical cheese that gets you through the situation. And I swear, Rockfish Games, the chaps who developed Everspace 2, must be gym rats, dude. Because they sure love the repetition. It's always three series of six, or eight, or twelve reps. And should you fail during any of these fights, you have to start over from the first wave. Because like we said, there is no saving in between or at all during the succession of steps that takes place in Planet B. So because I noobishly followed the main quest line and took on the various side quests that I came across, only, I ended up suffering this screen many more times than I ever suffered this screen. That should tell you all you need to know. I raged, I yelled, I woke up people in the middle of the night, I went from being deeply immersed in the experience to this. I'm going to hunt down the shit for brains inventor of this crooked game and pull his inspiration out through his asshole. And almost by the end of the game I found out that there was no need for any of that. See, the best part about Everspace 2 is its exploration aspect. I watched Never Knows Bestest video the other day in which he talked about space exploration in video games. He nailed it, of course, much like you'd expect, but all the way through I was thinking, this guy hasn't played Everspace 2. And I don't blame him, it's not exactly a game that markets itself as a space exploration game, but perhaps it should have, because my, my, what a treat it is to fly in and around the various planets, abandoned space stations, remote asteroids, and ruins of mysterious advanced civilizations that are no longer around. It truly feels like gliding into the unknown, into a mystery that is only there for you to unravel. And the game does not tell you this, but you better believe that it expects you to heed the call of adventure. As you traverse the galaxy from planet to planet, or even from solar system to solar system, you'll be hit by all manners of unknown signals, distress calls, and undiscovered sites. And believe me, you want to take a look at those as soon as you can. Most of them lead to fascinating planets where there are secret secrets to be found and quests to be undertaken. And most of the best content in the game is hidden away within these undiscovered sites. Everspace 2 is at its best when it manages to integrate exploration and puzzle solving into a seamless experience. And this happens mostly in these off-track planets and systems. And visiting these planets and taking an interest in these unknown signals and distress calls is not only where the game truly shines, but it's also how you keep your ship up to date with the best gear and how you keep yourself on the right level. It also brings moments of respite between one space bullet hell and the next. The bottom line here is that being all hell bent on following those quest markers and never stopping to take a look at these other things flashing on your screen as you traverse the galaxy is not a great plan in this game. Plus, if you do that, 
like I did at first, like a complete idiot, you'd only be robbing yourself of the most interesting content in the game. Combat has its moments, I'm not gonna lie. I especially like those combat encounters that tie into story milestones and events. And I most especially like those combat encounters that are thrown in as additional obstacles in a mission that's mostly all about exploration and puzzle solving. Combat encounters that are tied to story events often funnel you into doing things the one way you are expected to, and I hated that. But on those rare occasions in which the game lets you play in the park however you wish, whilst also advancing the story, there is a truckload of fun to be had. Your spaceship handles beautifully. The controls feel flowy enough to give you a proper feeling of weight and inertia, tight enough for your ship to feel adequately responsive, but not tight enough to feel arcadey and cheap. Combat has its issues though. Let's say for explanation's sake that the x-axis is the one that runs from wing to wing on your spaceship, the y-axis is the one that goes from top to bottom, and the c-axis is the one that goes from cockpit to thrusters, yes? Well, I never really had any issues telling how far right or left an enemy was, and I could also always tell whether an enemy was above or below my spaceship. It was the c-axis that I had the most trouble with, because spaceships that were two kilometers away looked exactly the same size as those who were 7 kilometers away or 800 meters. And that made prioritizing targets one monumental living hell all the way through. I think I needed some sort of video game journalist mode, like an AI guided top view drone or something to give me some sort of Space Invaders perspective. Having a little Space Invaders like screen showing every target within range would have gone a long way in assessing the sea axis proximity of my enemies. Over the course of the game, you will encounter different enemy ships with different talents. Some of them are sniper types of ship, others teleport in and out of combat, others do damage over time with fire attacks, others freeze you, others spawn enemies, etc. There are also plants that latch onto your ship and pull you towards venomous clouds, acid spewing fungi, and mysterious galactic sentient energy entities that lunge at you. So enemy variety is pretty freaking good in this game, but most of these enemies you only get to see mid to late game, which is a bit of a shame. Exploration is again definitely the aspect of the game that steals the show here. Like we said, your spaceship handles beautifully. You can thrust through vast extensions of sandy surfaces, glide slowly through maze-like systems of caves, and even go underwater for some pretty cool submarine exploration. Planets have intricate topographies and are often home to abandoned ruined ships and ancient architecture. They have also pretty varied weather conditions, and some of these planets are lava-based, others are ice-based, others seem to be made of some sort of crystal. Some of these landscapes can be realistic and frightening, and many of them are a joy to simply stand there and watch. But there's also a certain feeling of accomplishment to the exploration aspect of the game. Some planets feature seamless, mist-like puzzles that you need to solve if you wish to further progress into the discovery of the MacGuffin, or the OP piece of loot, or the ancient secret that you're supposed to be after. And sometimes there's even light combat thrown in for good measure. And this pretty much beat the crap out of my every expectation. Exploration that is both chillaxy and challenging at the same time? This is fucking brilliant. These two things rarely go together, but they do in Everspace 2, and it works masterfully. Some of the game's undiscovered sites and unknown signals aren't about exploration. Some of these locations have combat challenges too. And in my experience, these particular combat encounters weren't excruciatingly difficult, and you could always say fuck it and flee the planet if you felt like you didn't stand a chance. These combat encounters typically had this one condition that you had to dance around, like not being able to see the enemy's health bar, or enemies having some sort of undeath effect, or being extra strong, or something equally ARPGistic. But the reward for heeding these distress calls and unknown signals was more often than not very much worth a hassle. Amongst the loads upon loads of loot that you're going to find in this game, there are likely going to be a few maps marking the location of hidden planets. And as soon as you read these maps, these planets are going to appear on your galaxy map, along with some very convenient extra information like the level of challenge and the category of loot that you can expect to find there. Puzzle solving is a big aspect of the game in Everspace 2, and this is how I would categorize these challenges. First, the Batman Arkham series-like puzzles. 
These are about figuring out some type of mechanical logic by pressing buttons and socketing items into places to gain access to some sweet loot. These aren't mandatory and can sometimes serve to take a break from the action. Some of them are okay, but some of them are insultingly easy. Second, the seamlessly integrated puzzles. These are things that you need to figure out in order to be able to navigate a location or gather extra knowledge about the mysterious world that is no longer around, so to speak. These are without question my favorite puzzles in Everspace 2 because they elevate the exploration aspect of the game, and I think the gaming world needs more of these puzzles in all genres. Third, the Saeed Masani Angry Rant types of puzzle. I'm going to hunt down the shit for brains inventor of this crooked game and pull his inspiration out through his asshole. These puzzles include events with time limits, insta-fail puzzles that require surgical precision and split-second timing, and some other utterly disgusting shit that nobody asked for, like dragging this piece of shit energy source through a super lengthy crystal tube while avoiding a moving laser whilst making use of unfamiliar clunky drone mechanics or moving this piece of shit drone through these moving walls of energy, or timing the intervals of these flames to get a drone through to the other side. And unfortunately, there are puzzly boss fights that fall into this category. Fuck off, game. All in all, there is a lot of high quality fun to be had in this game, but I suspect that even if you take the time to engage in all this delicious non-mandatory content from time to time, to take a break from the combat and the questing, to level up a little, and to farm some precious loot, which we have already established is the secret to stay on top of the combat challenges of the game, you are still going to go into a raging spree of keyboard smashing and yelling at walls every now and then even if you aren't the type of person who does these things. And it's not just because of the Saeed Masani angry rant type of puzzles, but because the game actively goes out of its way to break your balls. And your balls are probably different from mine, but just in case they are similar, let me tell you about how Everspace 2 broke them for me. There are split-second timing insta-kill challenges in this game, not unlike the ones you had in platforming games like Ninja Gaiden and Battletoads back in the day. There are respawns, or rather, enemies can fly in and out of planets from time to time. There are enemies that are immune or highly resistant to some types of damage. There are insane difficulty spikes. Fast travel is a privilege. You only unlock it very late in the game, and you need expensive and rare materials to craft a fast travel node. This is not ball breaking all by itself, and it could have made for an interesting feature with a great sense of accomplishment to it, but it's definitely ball breaking for this type of game. In missions that revolve around combat, there is no way of knowing if you are up against one or eight waves of enemies beforehand, and if your plan is to face this uncertainty by carrying about a truckload of consumables, know that your ship's carrying capacity is very limited. Many challenges are repeated several times within the same mission. During combat missions, you cannot save your game whenever you want. If you get killed by the last guy in the last wave of enemies, you'll have to start over from scratch. That happened to me more than once, by the way. And last but definitely not least, there are long, mandatory chase sequences with insta-fail conditions. And there you go, those are the things that broke my balls in this game. Was it worth it? Well, 20% of the time I was having an unmitigated 10 out of 10 blast of an experience. 30% of the time the fun factor sat solidly somewhere between 7.5 and 8.5. 20% of the time the game was meh, which is to say somewhere around a 6 out of 10. And 30% of the time, I was like, Fuck you, you fucking fuckers. When the game shines, it truly shines, though. And it shines with its own light. The feeling of adventure you get from the exploration aspect of the game in Everspace 2 is amazing. I should also say that it has one of the most original forms of endgame that I have seen in an ARPG. And it's one of the very few endgame concepts that has gotten me to play an ARPG beyond its campaign mode. See, after the credits roll, you can continue to play the game. You can explore the remaining planets and complete some of the remaining quests, but more importantly, there are now new story-driven mysteries and quests for you to do after the game's done. It's like, then they lived happily ever after, but there was still some adventure to be had, and I like it. Gameplay in Everspace 2 is a mixed bag. I loved it and I hated it, but I definitely don't regret the time spent with it. 
loot, gear, and builds. Everspace 2 is like your typical ARPG in this respect, but instead of helmets, boots, body armor, swords, and shields, you get primary weapon, secondary weapon, armor, shield, and booster sensor slots. You also have consumables which you can assign hotkeys to and devices which are items that have very impactful effects but also very long cooldown times. And the items that you can socket into these slots are properly tiered and balanced with opportunity cost, which is to say that when you find a new item, unless it's several levels higher than the one you have in the pertinent slot, it is very unlikely that it'll be flat out better in every way than the one you already have. And this means that there is a ship build aspect to the game. It's not very tactical, but there is. If you want to go for a glass cannon build, for example, you are going to prefer those items which have high damage stats in favor of those that add resilience and survivability to your ship. There's also a wide assortment of consumables in this game that do all sorts of things for you, and these are also relevant to your ship's build. You have damage boosters, for example, which is the perfect consumable to have on a glass cannon build. And there are also a ton of devices that are perfect for a daredevil like you because they do a fuck ton of damage at the expense of, well, not contributing in any significant way to your defenses. But if you are a survivor type like myself, you're probably going to prefer consumables like nanobots that repair your ship, damage mitigators, and speed boosters. On the equipment department, you are overall going to favor items that have greater defensive stats, and on the weapon end of things, you are probably going to prefer range over damage. There is a great variety of consumables, weapons, armor, and devices, but their build value depends on boring flat stat numbers. None of them have any special skill to make them tactically interesting in any way. Weapons are the only items that offer some form of fun tactical variety. You have beam types of guns, which fire a precise long-range laser beam that isn't particularly powerful, and these are good to get rid of incoming projectiles and to target enemies from afar. They can also be useful against shields. Some weapons work like shotguns. They hit like trains, they have spread, but their firing rate is agonizingly slow and they have very short range. Railguns can be very powerful to kill enemies quickly, but they are not very efficient against shields and they require you to go in for the kill if you want to make the most out of them. Then you have weapons that have interesting synergies like Umbra and Penumbra which don't hit as hard but increase each other's damage significantly when you use them in combination. There are some sets of equipments that have bonuses, much like you do in games like Diablo, but they are rare finds and the bonus stats that you get from the set are rarely worth keeping an eye out for these items. Everspace 2 is an endless loot piñata, much like 99% of the games in the genre, and of course 99% of the stuff that drops is shit. But loot is adequately tiered and the rarity of the drops seems pretty well balanced. You have standard items, which are a dime a dozen, green items, which are like your regular low tier magic item, blue items, and purple epic items. There are also a few legendary items, but unlike every other category of item, you can only acquire these by completing some of the most excruciatingly difficult quests in the game. And I like that many of these quests aren't even mandatory. Item optimization is actually pretty impressive. Equipment can be upgraded in several ways. You can find blueprints that unlock new levels for your equipment. These upgrades require materials, of course, and that's where exploration comes in. The rarer the upgrade, the rarer the material needed, and the rarer and more inhospitable the planet where you can get said material. You can also increase the level and the rarity of the item, making it flat out more powerful. And it is a good idea to do this with those items that you are already happy with. The vices are game-changing items with long cooldown time. They are already pretty OP in their base form, but with the right materials, you can enhance them many times over. One thing that I am not particularly crazy about in Everspace 2 is the fact that, as varied and as costumizable as all these moving parts are, every spaceship build seems to play out almost exactly the same. I have only played the game once, but over the course of the playthrough, I felt like dusting off my afterburner and early 90s FPS skills went a longer way than strategizing about my ship's build. And this feels odd. The way I see it, ARPG players thrive on the strategic assessment of their strengths and weaknesses. This assessment allows them to come up with a plan that makes the most out of their strengths and mitigates their weaknesses. 
This in turn translates into a particular choice of gear and talents within the talent tree, as well as a very careful selection of the items that work best for their tactical approach. But this all seems kind of marginal in Everspace 2. Just equip the best gear available for every slot and pay some attention to the stats that you want to favor. That's as far as the build aspect of the game goes in this game. It would have been cool if you had talents like summoning drones to wear down your enemies or having more types of reliable damage over time attacks and effects and items with perks that improved upon these skills. But for the most part, combat in Everspace 2 is just duck and cover pew, 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 or hardcore dogfighting a la Afterburner, which means that you must be very good at this regardless and good gear only makes you more efficient at the only tactic that you truly have. And this makes all those awesome customization options feel like a bit of a wasted opportunity. You have heard me say this before in this review, have you? Secondary mechanics and user experience. This is a game of secondary mechanics. Enhancing your weapons and your ships entail the procurement of resources and really looking into how you want to go on about the allocation of these resources. But in addition to those, you also have mining, trading, and crafting. Mining is the dumbest shit ever. You shoot at veins and your tractor beam gathers the resources automatically. So yes, this game is definitely not about mining. But these mineral veins add further value to your exploration because exploration is meant to be the most important way to procure these resources in Everspace 2. Resources are needed to craft consumables and to upgrade your ship and equipment. And you can craft some pretty interesting stuff that makes a bit of a difference in combat. So this aspect of the game is fairly fulfilling. Trading is interesting in Everspace too. There are goods that you can buy and sell for a profit like wine, ramen, clothes and other supplies. Don't expect the complexity of a sandbox RPG in this respect, but do put some thought into it. If you're going to make trading an important source of income for you, you should plan your camping around that because cargo space is very limited and there is a fuck ton of loot in this game. I feel like trading goods should have had much more market value than equipment because as it is, you are always going to prefer to carry about something that you can use, sell or scrap than something that you can only sell. One interesting thing about trading in this game is that it feels fairly well integrated into the game's core gameplay aspect. Merchants are important in this game. Many of them are part of the main story, others have interesting side missions, and most will give you some sort of discount or will make available certain special items for you to purchase after you help them. Some will even come to your aid as allies for the final stretch of the game. The user experience is eh, a mixed bag. Flying around, shooting, exploring, solving puzzles, all of this is fairly intuitive and seamless. But everything that has to do with resource management, the various forms of upgrades, and trade felt unintuitive and unnecessarily complicated to me. There were too many, use this key to perform such action, and the same key, but holding it down, to perform this other action. Dudes, I have a mouse for a reason, you know? I think they should have relayed more information via tooltips and modal windows, and they should have had more comparison windows displaying your actual whatever versus the would-be changed version of said whatever. Also, some of the materials your companions require for the upgrades they offer are components that you can find while traversing the galaxy or craft, provided you have the necessary raw materials. And I think the companion perk system is seriously lacking a leaner one-click feature in the component screen. And in your companion's upgrade screens, clicking around was unreliable and clunky. Depending on where you clicked, you would deselect the upgrade or open up the screen that shows the components needed for the upgrade. At least once I bought an upgrade that I wasn't interested in. We already have said how fast travel in this game is a privilege, but know that it's also not particularly intuitive to use. Overall, secondary mechanics add quite a bit of flavor to the experience, but the UX of most of those mechanics could have been a lot leaner and a lot more intuitive. Story and lore. Not what you paid the price of the admission for in an ARPG, but a good story is always welcome in any game, isn't it? Let's put it this way, it's a very interesting building, but the apartments have very cheesy furniture, which means that the structure of the story per se is quite alright. I was surprisingly engaged all the way through, I was invested in the characters and in the situation. The protagonist was highly unlikable almost all the way through, but he kinda grew on me. 
but I think this was mostly because he had to deal with people who were even more unlikable. As people, though, not as characters. Most characters were pretty decent. You have Discount Idris Elba, Discount Lucy Liu, and lots of other fascinating people to talk to. Discount Idris Elba is the standout for me. He was way more likable and interesting than the main character, that's for sure. Just don't get too attached to the man. The story in Ever Space 2 serves its purpose quite efficiently. There is gravitas, tension, and something big always at stake. And this makes your actions matter. It is pushed forward by random events every now and then, and some characters just pop out of nowhere when the plot needs them to. But the most important characters have strong, believable motivations, mostly because they have a lot to lose or gain at any given time. It felt like a good old 80s B-film. Fun, unpretentious, and straightforward. I liked it. Actually, I liked it a lot. It also has an epic final stretch in which the people you helped out over the course of the game come to your aid. That's something typically CRPGistic. You don't ever see this in ARPGs. So I think Everspace 2 gets an extra point for that. It gets a minus, though, because the plot strongly leans into the evil clone cliché. And developers and writers everywhere? This cliché? You need to stop that. The dialogue was drenched in cheese to the point of being cringy from time to time, but never enough to make any situation feel farcical or unbelievable. And it has a pretty good old-fashioned happy and fulfilling ending. And you won't hear me complain about those. The story in Everspace 2 won't win any awards, but I don't think it expects to. Overall, it's pretty, pretty decent, given the genre. Sound effects, mix, and voice acting. such a thing when they are near the end. No, I'm not speaking metaphorically. I really think I see a way out. Hey, dude, it's you! What the...? My old friend Adam Roslin. It's me, Alec. What brings you here? Come to rescue your old buddy? Rescue? Yeah, Daryl sent me here to pick up a package. I meant to do air quotes for that last part. Judging from that pile of desiccated corpses over there, this is where he sends anyone he wants out of the way. But fancy seeing you here, just as I thought I was going to croak it. What a kawinky dings. Oh! I'm glad you got that one. I especially didn't like her. mixed bag? Sound mix is mostly pretty good. In a game like this, getting sound cues right is mandatory for developers. The player needs to know where shit is coming from and they need to have an idea of just how far things are. And sound cues are a player's best friend when it comes to calculating distances. Like we've said, exploration is hands down the best part about the game, and the sound design has a lot to do with this. In some of the planets, there are sound signals that you need to follow in order to find the item that you need for the next part of the mission or to complete a puzzle, and the sound cues worked perfectly in every case. In some other planets, there are doors that open and things that move as a consequence of you pressing X button or socketing Y item in Z place. 
and this often happens somewhere around the planet that's well outside your visual range. And I think this adds no small amount of excitement to the exploration aspect of the game and to the feeling of accomplishment that you get when you effectively complete your exploration goals. The sound effects per se are another mixed bag. There are some strange contraptions and devices that you have to fiddle about with and most of these make some of the most awesome sounds when operated. All the devices that have to do with the mysterious ancient civilization are a standout to me. They are not overly compressed or isolated from the rest of the sound, but well integrated into the rest of the sonic landscape. They sound echoey when they take place in caves and dry when they are out in more spacey locations. Overall, pretty good. It's the combat sounds though that I find underwhelming in this game. There is not a single gun in this game that sounds badass. There's no sonic ownage of the bad guys. And in a game with pew pew mechanics, this is unacceptable. They're not bad, they're just aggressively okay-ish. That's a big minus there if you ask me. The sound design of the secondary mechanics interface, like your trading or crafting screens, is consistent with the theme of the game and I don't have too much to say about it. As for the voice acting, well, the voice actors do the best they can with the cheeseball lines they've been given. Elec is a standout, but because he's quirky to the point of being ridiculous, and Dax is probably the next in line, but he looks so much like Idris Elba that you can't avoid comparing the two. And well, tough shit for this guy because Idris Elba happens to have one of the best voices out there. Compared to your average CRPG, I would say the voice acting here is competent. Compared to your average ARPG, it's actually pretty good, but it's still nothing to write home about. As a whole, the sound package is serviceable music. Wow, I did not like this at all. Admittedly, any space game is going to have a hard time pushing the right buttons for me after Stellaris. God damn it, that soundtrack is just so fucking good. But this one feels wrong. I think it's the wrong artistic choice, the wrong production, the wrong mix, and it feels lacy. I think they should have gone for something more modern space gens like Tides of Nebula and less 90s Technotronics. It's way too 90s synthy in my opinion. I ended up lowering the music volume to zero and playing some spacey gent instead. I played a few music snippets like I usually do for you to judge for yourselves whether or not it is as bad as I say, but I sure as hell didn't like it one bit. Graphics. This is a pretty solid package for the most part. Locations are without question the standout aspect of the package, except the underwater location. These could have felt more like actual lakes and oceans with marine life swimming about and different types of algae. As they are, they feel like an extension of the surface location. But you can tell that planets aren't randomly generated. The topography in these planets is intricate and unique and filled with systems of caves, abandoned ruins, and other interesting places for you to explore. Spaceports are also pretty detailed and fun to explore. Prescott Starbase is a standout, of course. It's vibrant, busy, and elaborate. It's not really that big, but it feels like it's huge and it's easy to get lost in it. Character portraits and cutscenes are good, for me at least, but this is a $50 game that you can get for $28.81 on good old games. Hurry up while it lasts. And this is what a cutscene looks like in Everspace 2. I can see some people not being entirely happy about the production values on display here. I'm okay with them, but, well, there it is. As for enemy spaceships, I don't know, man. I feel like I was rarely close enough to make out how they looked, but with the exception of bigger vessels, every spaceship looked pretty much the same to me. And that made some of the most dangerous enemies in the game feel a little bit meh to me. But even the biggest vessels in the game were nothing to write home about. And listen, spaceships have to look badass in space games. 
I think this is a must, because a space universe has to feel expansive, threatening, rare, teeming with different species that are in different stages of technological advancement. And different spaceships with varied designs and sizes constitute one of the most important aspects of the feeling of the great unknown that one usually expects from these space-themed games, shows, and films. To be fair, this gets significantly better later on in the game. But the fact that you only get to see the badass stuff in the last third of the game makes the whole experience feel uneven and a bit unfulfilling for a good chunk of the game. Your equipment, consumables, and devices look pretty cool, and the iconography that you see on your hub, as well as the many secondary mechanics screens, is adequate. But nothing impressive. These guys need to recruit the dudes that work on NKs if they want to up their game. Overall, graphics are also a bit of a mixed bag, but leaning on the good side, I would say. Performance and stability. I have read about a few people having issues on launch, but for me, it was perfect. I'm not kidding you, perfect. I had no crashes. I had no noticeable FPS drops, no graphic glitches, no bugs, nothing. Loading screens were also surprisingly quick, but that was in part because they played it very smartly with the intergalactic travel. Very elegant solution there, chaps, kudos. I don't think I've ever said this of any game before on the channel, but this is a 10 out of 10 in my book in this category. Other considerations and final thoughts. If I had to review this game with one phrase, it would be a giant wasted opportunity. I saw Never Know Asbestos video on space exploration in video games, and I could tell that he didn't play this one. I mean, why would he? This game is marketed mostly as a pew 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 story-driven space ARPG. And yet, hidden away within it, you have one of the best exploration experiences out there. And if the game had leaned on these aspect of the gameplay mix, it might have even been memorable. But it is an ARPG that focuses on combat, and a lot of it is generic and unfulfilling. Builds aren't exciting, and they don't translate all that efficiently into different playstyles. It's packed full with annoying features and mechanics like mandatory chase sequence and split-second timing challenges. It does not allow you to save whenever you wish during some combat situations. It does not allow you to quit missions that you might be underleveled for. It forces you to go through the same challenge two or three times for no reason. It's just fucking annoying from time to time. I cursed and yelled at the game almost as many times as I said, damn, this game is awesome, but I did do both things. And when I started visiting the undiscovered sites, looking into the unknown signals and completing the many missions that come out of these adventurous endeavors, the game kind of redeemed itself. I was also surprised at how good the story turned out to be, despite the cheesy dialogue lines. And the end game is something that I am currently enjoying a lot. But if I'm honest with you, it's well worth the 2881 but not the 50s. So hurry up, I guess, while the offer lasts. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, thank you for watching all the way up until now. If you like what you are seeing on this channel, please consider subscribing and clicking that notification bell to avoid the usual YouTube shenanigans. Share the video, come check us out on Discord if you don't mind all the boomer talk, but most importantly, never stop gaming, but don't let gaming get in the way of your hopes and dreams. Bye, everyone.